I have the good afternoon, everyone. I have the honor and the pleasure to introduce Dr. Greenblatt, who's my mentor um, in eating disorders and in psychiatry in general. He is a pioneer, pioneer in the field of functional and nutritional psychiatry. James M. Greenblatt, MD, is a licensed and dually board certified adult and child clinical psychiatrist. Dr. Greenblatt is the author of eight books, including the best-selling Finally Focused and Answers to Anorexia. 2021, Psychiatry Redefined is Dr. Greenblatt's online educational platform where he offers CME-approved courses and continued medical education programs for psychiatrists on functional medicine model for mental health. Dr. Greenblatt also supervises psychiatrists in one-year online fellowship program on functional psychiatry. Without further ado, I will like Dr. Greenblatt to um, start his lecture. And uh, Dr. Greenblatt, do you have uh, access to share your screen? I think so. Let's see. Can you see it? Can you see the screen? Yes. I see. Yes. yes. Okay. So uh, it's great to be here. Thank you, Ali. I think um, the most important part of my career has been teaching residents and fellow psychiatrists. So I am sharing this information from you, uh, for you, um, based on 30 years of uh, inpatient psychiatry treating those of our patients with the most severe mental illness, the vast majority being admitted for suicide attempts or suicidal ideation. So I need you to kind of have that perspective as I, I share this story. It's a probably three hour story um, and that I've squished into these 45 minutes. So I did uh, provide Ali with a link to the three hour program if anyone is interested. But let's get started and I'll try to leave time um, for, for questions. So I, I'm getting a little tired of the term crisis epidemic in mental health care. It's keeping us all busy, maybe too busy. But as we get more drugs, more screenings, more awareness, more checklists, um, our rates of mental illness, and again, for this presentation, suicide has not been touched and they continue to increase. So my first point has to be to rethink this term of a mental health crisis and, and reframe it as a crisis of care. The model, the model is broken. Any of our journal articles, right? You read the first paragraph from treatment refractory depression to suicide to schizophrenia to every other major mental illness. The first paragraph acknowledges our limitations, high relapse rate, and then they go on to a new plan. But, but that's where I'm starting here. Our current model of care is not good enough. And again, working for 30 years in inpatient, um, we're all aware of those that had made attempts from hanging and gunshots and two bottles of pills versus those that were thinking about it or took a few Tylenol. There's a difference. And, and that's what I wanna explore with you. And, and my life changed um, 25 years ago when I got into this field by accident of, of working with eating disorders. So um, for 25 years, I've been doing inpatient eating disorders as well and residential. It's a world that I promised during my residency I would never treat, and I'm sure many of you can experience the challenges, but it dramatically changed my concept of brain uh, health, nutrition and brain health in particular, and certainly um, suicide. Because I didn't know coming through training, I didn't know until I started working with patients with anorexia, that patients with anorexia not only the highest mortality rate, although now it's probably tied with opiate overdoses. So one of the highest mortality rates 
highest risk of suicide for any psychiatric illness, and anorexic patients are 31 more times likely to die of suicide. So it's not the heart attacks or the malnutrition that we worry about. It is suicide. So many years in adolescent psychiatry, I was never part of a completed suicide discussion. My work with anorexia nervosa, dozens and dozens of families have been in memorial services and, and part of community meetings mourning the loss of their child with anorexia nervosa. So it was this journey that got me thinking about, okay, what is going on with our patients with, with anorexia? And, and this is, is the model, and, and some of this is quite, it's all very simple. Um, and I'll go through some of these things, not all of them, that's the three hour program. But I, I want you to think about you as a clinician in the ER or you as a clinician on the inpatient unit um, or even the outpatient psychiatrist. When we think of some of these biomarkers that are well established in our literature, some going back 30 years, and what we could do, but more importantly, what we're not doing. And, and some of this I'm going to go through quickly to because I'm sure you know. So suicide, very high heritability. Um, we just have to look, I forget if these are seven or eight suicides in the Hemingway family. And what I've been very concerned about last few years is our psychiatric evaluations. You know, the family history is, is maybe a checkbox that is yes or no. And sometimes when I review a chart, I have to go through the psychosocial from the social worker to get a better family history. We are not doing good enough family histories, but suicide risk has to be established. The next piece is medications. I will share with you, again, do an inpatient psychiatry. When the black box warning came out for the SSRIs, it made no sense to me because I never experienced it. 10 plus years on an inpatient adolescent unit. As soon as I, I worked, as I remember the first week vividly um, on a unit, eating disorder unit, I saw a number of kids coming from our local children's hospital, put on an SSRI, intense, acute suicidal ideation they did not have prior to uh, the SSRI. We stopped the medication that went away. These are eating disorder patients. So this suicidal side effect, I think, has been um, ignored more recently and um, kind of downplayed. And particularly in our malnourished patients, it is profound. It happens all the time. And again, the literature is quite clear. There are a, a wide range of medicines. But I want to get to my work, the more important is some nutritional deficiencies that we're not allowed to talk about in psychiatry, right? And we're gonna talk about some of these, but we're gonna start with fat. And again, so much of this work has been based on my work with eating disorder patients. The highest risk of suicide of any psychiatric illness and the complete removal of fat from their diet, sometimes for five, 10, 15, or 20 years. So some of this material is pretty simple. 60% of the dry weight of the brain is fat, right? Just digest that as we kind of dive in a little bit into the uh, different kinds of fat, the saturated fat and essential fatty acids, the polyunsaturated. Every aspect of neurotransmission requires fat. Cell membrane is a fatty membrane. Cholesterol holds many of the receptors in place. And the polyunsaturated fatty acids keep the membrane fluid. So our field is pretty obsessed with neurotransmitters, uh, but we're missing the bulk of what happens in the brain, that is cell membranes and cell receptors which are highly dependent on adequate 
fat. And that's what we're going to dissect. Um, cholesterol actually kind of holds and regulates not only serotonin receptors, but oxytocin receptors and a whole host of other uh, receptors in the brain. So we're going to just talk a little bit about cholesterol. This is not a cardiac lecture. This is a how to prevent suicide lecture. And some of this is pretty dramatic. I had three slides on the function of cholesterol. I cut it down to one, but let's just think about it for a minute. Cholesterol, the demon of our medical community is essential as the precursor to every steroid hormone in the body, right? Think about that. There, there are hundreds. We think of testosterone and progesterone, DHEA and pregnenolone, but there are hundreds. So cholesterol, it's a precursor to vitamin D. And it has other, as I said, membrane functions. Cholesterol is critical for the function, even though our entire medical community is trying to rid this essential molecule. So my interest is low cholesterol. And we're going to use a couple terms, low and very low cholesterol. And the work started in the 90s. And those individuals, 94, 584 inpatients who had low cholesterol, higher risk of suicide, significantly lower serum cholesterol. Now, this is when I got involved. I was very interested in, in nutrition, uh, going to medical school. And this was a, a beta carotene study. Uh, it was a big study. So everyone was really excited. We're going to get rid of cancer by using beta carotene. They actually stopped the study because uh, the cancer patients got worse. But they did this sub, they found this subgroup of people that got depressed and, and some that killed themselves. And they were able to analyze this group and these had low cholesterol, okay? Total low cholesterol, higher risk of hospitalization, depression, and out of this 29,000 individuals, suicide deaths. So 99 is when I got interested in low cholesterol and just to put a framework for it. Most of the research, I'm going to share with you just a few articles, are they, they, they utilize this the concept of low cholesterol and it's total cholesterol, nothing to do with HDL or LDL, total cholesterol. The research has been on total under 140. But we'll get to that. So more studies. Uh, there's probably at least 50 research studies that that I can find. There's probably more. I just used a few in the last few years. These are 43, 432 attempters uh, with blood collected uh, 24 hours of the attempt. And this concept of high and low lethality. Again, it's the overdose of a few pills versus the gunshot or the hanging. And what we find in this low cholesterol community um, is that the higher lethality is lower total cholesterol. And this is a theme that I'll share with you from my clinical experience, but the literature as well, the lower the cholesterol, the more aggressive or violent the suicide attempts are. And here, uh, looking at um, uh, a, a number of individuals um, looking at specific numbers here, they were able to correlate a, a 10 milligram per deciliter drop, increase the risk of suicide. So the lowest total cholesterol, three to four times the higher risk of suicide death. 2019. And again, I'm going to keep uh, looking at this concept of violence. Um, the couple studies looking at um, uh, post-mortem. And here we compare the brains of uh, those that died of motor vehicle accidents. So age match controls versus suicide. Um, and the violent suicide completers lower total cholesterol. 
versus nonviolent suicide. Um, again, more, this should be um, lower total cholesterol, no, higher predicted lower suicidal ideation with PTSD in 2014. Again, same themes, violent versus nonviolent, lower total cholesterol. And here's our another, um, this one we just went through, it's just a repeat. So again, there are hundreds of studies. This was just a meta-analysis of this concept of this essential nutrient for brain stabilization of multiple receptors for the synthesis of all steroid hormones, vitamin D, bile acids, we can go on and on. Over 510,000 individuals, the lowest total cholesterol, higher risk of ideation, attempt, and suicide completion. A few articles out of hundreds. So let me introduce you to my world. I gave a lecture. Uh, to the medical staff at my hospital. This was um, the year before COVID. Everything is pre and post COVID. So it wasn't COVID. Um, and, and I gave a, a similar lecture. And um, I just said, let's spend the next month looking at lipid panels. Now, I don't know about um, in New Mexico, but in, in Massachusetts, we don't routinely get lipid panels on our psych patients, right? Our, our psych units are usually per diem rates, so we just don't get lots of labs. And um, maybe if someone's on an antipsychotic, we can get some uh, triglycerides and you know a workup for uh, a metabolic panel, but but that's not usual. So. I made the decision we were going to pay for these lipid panels. And, you know, within the first few weeks, these are the cases that I got. And let me tell you um, about this individual with a total cholesterol of 69. Again, this is one month of checking an inpatient unit. This is a, a young uh, man who had a multiple uh, past suicide attempts um, by overdosing and hanging. And he was admitted to our hospital after a hanging attempt. And um, he, he was lucky to be alive because his father returned home and he wasn't supposed to. And his total cholesterol was 69. Again, this is not LDL or HDL. This is not dietary related. He was eating hamburgers, hot dogs, and plenty of dietary fat in his diet. And then during that month, we had two other individuals um, one was a male, one was a female, um, all under 30, all admitted for uh, depression and uh, suicide attempts. Okay, I'm going to keep going with this theme of fat. Uh, we talked about cholesterol, and now we're going to talk about the uh, omega-3 essential fatty acids. And again, every aspect of neurotransmission is contingent upon the availability of these essential fats. And I guess it's important to kind of use that word essential again, particularly when I'm in my eating disorder um, space with our patients. Essential means our body can't make it, which means we have to obtain it from our diet. And if we're not eating any omega-3s, we can become deficient very quickly. And I'm sure you've all seen some of the literature. Again, I go back 30 years where I started reading about omega-3s and depression and anxiety and ADHD. And, and we're talking about extensive literature looking at the relationship between these essential fatty acids and major psychiatric illness. Right, the, the, the big study at uh, McLean in 99, giving 10 grams of omega-3s, uh, dramatically affecting relapse rates in bipolar, kind of put it on the map. Um, but so much of the research is hidden and it's international. But this is a discussion of suicide risk and depression. And, and these numbers 
are just simple. This is dietary intake of omega-3 linked to greater risk of death from suicide, higher risk of depression, and higher risk of suicidal thoughts. This is one of the earlier studies. And when this came out, I remember everyone really focused on combat and PTSD and the stress of being in the military. And then we, they looked at it. Um, these were individuals that were never deployed or 80%, I think is the number, 85% not deployed. But those with the lowest omega-3 levels they looked at DHA here, 62% were likely to be suicide victims. And for years, it was actually our uh, veterans uh, research and NIMH and military budgets doing, here's our thing, doing this research. And it was this was one of a number of studies looking at omega-3s to prevent depression and suicide at, at risk veterans. Uh, the numbers were positive. And guess what? They use these omega-3 enhanced foods in K rations um, for years. I don't know if they're still doing it. Um, the place where they made these uh, the foods for the, the military was actually in, in Natick, not too far from where I live. But this was, um, this is true. A number of years ago, this was a pound cake and a fettuccine alfredo that they enhanced with omega-3s because the military had done enough research showing low omega-3s was risk factor for suicide. Again, one of many, many studies. So hopefully you're familiar with these essential fatty acids. And, and again, you know, we're all trying to eat fish and maybe many of you are taking a fish oil supplement, but how many of you are sitting across from your patients recommending or understanding how to recommend omega-3s or tests for those that might be very deficient, particularly in our at-risk individuals for suicide? So I quickly went over family history. I quickly went over low cholesterol. I quickly went over essential fatty acids. Now I want to go to something that's been an important part of my career for uh, almost 40 years is understanding lithium. And we're going to go back and forth a little bit from our prescription uh, lithium carbonate to what I will just refer to as nutritional lithium. But this is a presentation of the functional medicine model, how to prevent suicide. And the literature is overwhelming. These are some old studies, but there's been 22 and 23 th studies. Lithium is anti-suicidal, similar to some studies with Clozeril. This was adults, many, many more. And here's, we have kids. So we're not gonna go through that, but here we have a medication that's anti-suicidal, that's not adequately utilized um, by our community as an anti-suicidal intervention, likely uh, because it's dose uh, related. But what I wanna share with you is my interest in lithium goes back a few years um, and I think it's probably 13.8 billion years. Right, this is the Big Bang. Lithium was one of the first three elements in the creation of this universe. And then we can go, I don't know, 3.8 billion years uh, to the creation of the Earth, and lithium was embedded in the Earth. And then it's leached into our water supply. And this is just a map. You don't have to memorize the colors, but just think about each color reflects a different amount of lithium in the drinking water. Lithium is essential for human health. We get most of our lithium from our drinking water. There are bits and pieces that get in our food supplies, not much in animal products, but it is um, small amounts 
in our diet, but the reality is most of the lithium and it averages around two milligrams a day. It varies again, depending on where you live, two milligrams a day um, from our food supply. Okay, lithium, big bang, lithium in the earth's crust, lithium in the rocks, leaches into the water supply, gets into our food supply, critically important for human health, particularly brain health. And the more interesting story of lithium starts in the early 1900s, where 7-Up was a lithiated soft drink. How did they get 7-Up as a name? Well, look at the... Um, Atomic weight of lithium, 6.94. That didn't fit on the label. So they rounded up to seven. Up is lift your mood. So this was a, a drink in the early 1900s used to lift your mood. You see here it talked about hangovers, irritability. It was a lithiated soft drink uh, for many years until um, someone had this great idea of putting lithium in salt shakers um, in the 40s. And uh, so people wouldn't take sodium, those with uh, congestive heart failure. And uh, I think there was a handful of people that died. So lithium was taken out of everything. But this is the world that um, many of you travel in, the pharmaceutical utilization of lithium carbonate, 600 milligrams to whatever we need. Uh, I do prescribe lithium as an inpatient psychiatrist, but I've been fascinated with this concept of nutritional lithium and even asking the question, is there such a thing as lithium deficiency? And this is where we're going to go back to the map of different amounts of lithium in the drinking water over the last 4 billion years. And this is where we go back to 1970. Many of you learned this, you know, in training. It was the classic study looking at lithium in tap water across 26 different counties in Texas. And if you had high lithium levels, guess what? Less admissions to psych wards, less violence. Um, they, they looked at crime, rape, suicides, and homicides. And higher lithium, lower rates. So that started this discussion and it just continued. This is um, kind of a hard slide to read, but probably the most important thing I can share with you today. This is a map of research that has been done around the globe over the past 25, 30 years, looking just and microdoses of lithium in the drinking water associated with suicide risk. So the Texas, it was another study done in Texas in the nine, it published in the 90s, it was done in the 80s. And these are the dates when these studies were done. And they all demonstrated lower lithium in the drinking water we're talking about micrograms of lithium per liter inversely associated with the suicide risk. Higher lithium, lower risk. So it's not one study, it's many studies. And then there's been some renewed interest. It's a 2020 kind of meta-analysis looking at millions of individuals across many different studies and profound, think about it. Almost 4 million people, lithium in the drink water, dose dependent with reduced suicide mortality. And there's more. So this was um, a gentleman in, in England published this meta-analysis and he actually was part of the group that published the only negative study ever published on uh, lithium uh, and suicide. And he, I spoke with him and uh, Meeman, and he kind of reported that it was a poorly done study. The, the lithium uh, doses uh, levels were not sufficiently different enough to make an association. And that was 
20 years ago, and he's put his career into looking further into this. He's an epidemiologist, and he put his, uh, this paper in the British Journal of Psychiatry 2020, um, 415 studies, naturally occurring lithium, you have the potential to reduce suicide risk. I mean, it is just pretty dramatic. And, and when we talk about lithium, again, it's a much longer discussion. We know lithium as a pharmaceutical has anti-suicide properties, but what I'm sharing with you, we have many years of research saying these microdoses are alti, also anti-suicidal. So when we have a patient that we put on three, 600 milligrams of lithium and they have side effects and they can't tolerate it, we just take them off. And hopefully, I, I can share with you, there's a role for low-dose lithium that can have profound anti-suicide properties. Okay, we're going to keep going uh, with our model. And we talked about nutritional deficiencies of fat, omega-3s, cholesterol, lithium, and, and now something just so incredibly simple, but just po powerfully ignored by our psychiatric community, vitamin D. Now, we, we know vitamin D in terms of its relationship to bone health. I guess COVID helped us become a little more uh, aware of vitamin D's relationship to immune function and inflammation. And I uh, think many of you are aware of vitamin D's relationship to uh, uh, epigenetics and being able to stimulate genes. But vitamin D is the rate limiting cofactor for the synthesis of serotonin. Okay, so the tryptophan hydroxylase enzyme requires vitamin D. So we can't make adequate serotonin without vitamin D. The research on vitamin D across all major psychiatric illnesses is, is extensive, probably have hours of, of presentations, hundreds of research articles from dementia to depression to anxiety. But we're going to just share a couple studies on suicidality. Okay, this was 157,000. This was a, a study from Korea looking at vitamin D levels under 10, associated with the risk, increasing risk of suicidal thoughts. Now, some of you might check vitamin D levels in your outpatient practice, but how many inpatient psychiatrists, how many emergency room doctors, how many family doctors, how many outpatient psychiatrists I'm monitoring or looking at a vitamin D level for someone coming in with a suicide attempt or at risk for suicide. And we can't talk about vitamin D without establishing that the lowest levels are seen in those in our communities with darker skin, right? They just don't absorb vitamin D lower and there are a number of other genetic issues. But this is where we see Vitamin D levels under 10. I've seen vitamin Ds of seven. I've, I've seen a one individual with undetectable vitamin D. We like to treat everyone under 30, but what's ignored is the relationship to de depression, dementia, but suicide. And we have the research. This was uh, an older study, but it's uh, really important because it looks at our... Um, vitamin D, so 58% of suicide attempts were vitamin D deficient. But here we get into our next discussion is low vitamin D is associated with this concept that we're all too familiar with, inflammation. Okay, low vitamin D, higher levels of inflammatory cytokines, IL-6 here, and We've been bombarded more so because of the role of inflammation and, and depression and suicide. Why? Because now we can put a pharmaceutical, an anti 
anti-inflammatory agent might help depression and suicide. So the pharmaceutical community is um, helping us out there. But this is our vitamin D link to inflammation, which is our next concept that we need to appreciate when we think about a biological model of suicide prevention. And, and again, inflammation is a, a generic physiological process, many, many factors, but they all can contribute to depression. Well, you've all been sick with a cold or a flu or COVID, you don't feel great. You can make that list of symptoms of sick syndrome. Um, but we now have research, not only depression, but suicide risk. I'll never forget uh, the cover of one of the magazines early in COVID, a ER physician, a young woman in her 30s who never had a mental health problem, got COVID, like many of us kept working as soon as she uh, recovered back in the ER. Uh, she actually had to take a leave of absence and go home uh, to the Midwest and, and she killed herself with no other motive. And just we'll never forget it. But but the research again has been clearly established. Many of you have read it, we know it, but I'm gonna keep kind of harping on how is this clinically integrated into our practice? But one of just many articles, higher inflammation here, 4.2 times more likely to die by suicide. Inflammation predicts suicide risk. Here's a more detailed study of uh, half a million individuals published in um, psychiatry in 2020, looking at this um, uh, GWA study over half a million individuals. Guess what? Higher inflammatory markers, higher risk for suicide. So as a psychiatrist and all the work that I'm doing for psychiatry to find, we're, we're trying to create a model of a, a precision psychiatry, a personalized medicine model, taking a step away from our symptomatic-based polypharmacy model. So we can't just throw out this term inflammation and then give another medication to try to help. So our goals in a functional medicine community is what's the source of inflammation? And again, these are just some we talked about vitamin D. Um, we talked about um, other nutritional deficiencies, but obesity, stress, COVID, Lyme, whole host of other infections can create this chronic inflammatory process that everyone is quite clear now is a risk for suicide, okay? And the one thing that, that's not here that um, might be the most important part in this connection is trauma, okay? So we haven't ignored our psychological, our psychosocial individuals, kids that have had social isolation, abuse, not only are they uh, under stress with major physiological changes during the trauma, but they have chronic inflammatory markers that we can see as adults. Okay, so trauma, we know that. It's in our checklist. We all have this checklist, substance abuse, living alone, elderly, trauma, trauma. It is a risk. But now I think it's pretty clear that we can make a direct correlation. What happens in trauma? It is chronic inflammation. And we can see these inflammatory markers. Okay, so there is a relationship. We can look at C-reactive protein, or if we're lucky, looking other inflammatory cytokines um, would just make a lot of sense. Save lives and, and save dollars. And you know, our last link to suicide and right through that inflammatory is our, our vitamin S and um, sleep deprivation. 
again, common sense, we know it, but are we addressing it in the ER, in the hospital, in our offices? So this just thrilled me, the textbook of suicide risk assessment and management. So third edition, first two editions did not address sleep or insomnia. But this edition, this is like a 400 page book, not that I read it, but I did buy it because there is a chapter with hundreds of references talking about sleep dysfunction and suicide risk. So, I mean, we can get embedded in an APA textbook. But again, I'm going to go back to that ER visit, that psych hospital. Are we educating and treating and addressing sleep dysfunction as a profound risk factor for suicide? And again, we could go on and on with studies. It's a 2020 study from Skytree Research, adolescents. Uh, insomnia prospectively associated with suicide. And again, could go on and on. I have one more study here. Um, here's uh, insomnia elevations of the IL-6 cytokine, cytokine associated with suicide risk. And here's the last one, 2021, more frequent symptoms of sleep dysfunction. And I think, um, you know, when you go through the literature in detail, I, I think we have data from the day before suicide, there was sleep disturbance. It is endless and it is substantial and we can't argue. So I've said some of the things about biomarkers linked with suicide risk, but are these routinely screened? Not really. Again, we can't afford to draw labs in inpatient psychi psychi uh, psychiatric hospitals, right? At least in the Northeast, because guess what? Because we don't pay enough on a medical unit. Every lab you can charge the insurance company or Medicare, right? So you can get your lipid panels and vitamin D and probably get C-reactive protein and cytokines. But no, on our psych units, we can't. So we're guessing. So I put the word functional medicine in the title because it's uh, just a field that I've grown up with for 30 years. There is some um, kind of stigma associated with it. There are CME companies that if you use the word functional medicine, they say no before they read it. And I just use it as a big picture way of talking about a systems biology approach to improving our mental health care. And from taking the word crisis to a crisis of care. We can look at root cause. And, you know, too much of our field is, is this, because of research, we look at one thing. I'm going to try to give vitamin D to everybody who's depressed and see if it helps with suicide. Well, guess what? 100 individuals might only be five that have vitamin D deficiency related to the depression and putting them at risk. So our research is kind of meaningless when we just look at statistics rather than the individual. But if we can unpack the individual and I just think of this, this kindling approach, we can start thinking about genetics. We can look at trauma for all the physiological implications, including we can look at malnutrition. I just focused on fat and vitamin D and lithium, but we could go on and on. I didn't talk about social media as the gasoline on this fire for our adolescents. I didn't talk about substance abuse because we're familiar with that trigger. I mentioned medications. I'm just worried that it's getting ignored as we're just adding more and more psychotropics because we're afraid to stop one. And we talked a little bit about sleep deprivation and inflammation. So functional psychiatry, nobody's given up their prescription pad. Nobody's given up their training in, in psychotherapy. I'm glad our community now can preach lifestyle. We can take, you know, yoga class, mindfulness. Maybe you should improve your diet. We have not looked at nutritional deficiencies well. 
we have not embraced genetics well, it's kind of haphazard, but there is a path. There is a path forward. And um, I just used this slide a number of years ago. I went to an orthopedic hand surgeon. I had tendonitis in my wrist. And this guy, he was wearing loafers without socks and khakis and a, just a golf shirt. I'm sure he was going out golfing. He came in, he looked at it and uh, gave me a, a shot. And I was fine. I never came back. And I was just thinking about this for, for a long time afterwards. This doctor only has to learn six inches, maybe, yeah, maybe eight inches of the human body that doesn't change that much. And at first I was jealous and enraged because, I mean, I'm learning something every day from my patients, from our literature. What do we know about the human brain? But, you know, I realized I chose this field. Everyone on this call has chose to be in our mental health for, for the re right reasons. So our jobs are not simple. Our psychopharm kind of community has tried to simplify it. And our clinical practice sometimes goes in that model, but it's it's complex. And, and I just wanted to share bits and pieces of someone who's been on the front lines of watching too many kids come in with multiple suicide attempts and then go into too many funerals where I know there's a literature that can help us predict these high-risk kids. So what does this mean? Well, that ER visit, that primary care visit, that first psychiatric visit, why wouldn't we be looking at three generations of family history? Why wouldn't we make sure that we can get vitamin D, C-reactive protein, other inflammatory markers covered? Why wouldn't we look at lipid panels? And there's actually some pretty cheap uh, panels of essential fatty acids. Lithium is a longer story. The short answer for me, let's see if we have, we have a few minutes, is that uh, my work over 30 years, that I believe those families, uh, particularly with substance abuse, family histories of addiction, depression, uh, agitated depression, bipolar illness, those are the families that have a higher need, I find, for lithium. And those are the ones that we can use low-dose carbonate, I often use 150 milligrams of lithium carbonate, which is only 28 milligrams of elemental lithium as a preventative agent for someone who's suicidal. So this is what I'm trying to, to see how we can integrate into our community to better assess in addition to all our other screening, I'm not throwing out the Columbia screening or some of our many other tools where we can look and we understand the role of alcohol and trauma and loneliness and shame and all that stuff. But there is a biology that's a piece of the puzzle that's being missed. So I'm, I'm going to stop. Uh, this is me. And uh, actually, here's the course that um, if anyone wants uh, the three-hour version, um, I gave uh, Ali and to keep the, uh, uh, the, an email. So it'll be a code for you if you wanted to listen to this. So I appreciate your time and, and interest. And uh, I think we have some time for questions. If that's... Thank you so much, Dr. Greenblatt, for the great presentation. And if anyone has any question, you can type it or you unmute yourself and speak. Hi, this is uh, Juan Pusti. You can hear me? Yes, yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Greenblatt. That was very interesting. Um, I mean, for, for us uh, clinicians, do you have a, a sense of what's the number needed to treat 
that that you would expect for this dose of lithium, this low dose of lithium in terms of preventing suicide? What I mean, are there any studies that support that that dose has a number needed to treat, uh, documented to have efficacy in suicide? No, not not in the low dose. I think we can easily uh, take the many many studies uh, looking at. Um, Pharmaceutical doses of lithium carbonate as anti-suicidal, kids, adults, research 20 years ago, research last year. So we know that. Um, there are no studies on uh, lower doses for the prevention of suicide. But okay, so so the, 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 the higher dose, all these studies, can you give us a sense of what's the number needed to treat uh, for lithium for prevention of suicide at the higher doses with all these studies? Uh, no, I I could not give you that accurately right now. Hi, Dr. Greenblatt. Dr. Green um, oh, excuse me, I'm Debbie Delmore. Um, I, on your last slide, I really appreciated the talk, really thought provoking. I can tell you're very compassionate about your care of patients and, and into your work. Um, the last slide where you showed factors to really think about laboratory testing, um, genetic testing, I'm wondering if you, perhaps I missed this in your talk and I apologize, but perhaps you can comment further on that in terms of two things. What genetic testing do you, do you routinely recommend any kind of genetic testing for those at risk for suicide? And the second question is, you mentioned cytokines. So what do you check for cytokines and which ones and, and do labs routinely uh, assess for those or are there, are there laboratories to check for those? Yeah, yeah great question. So um, the, the genetic in, in that slide was really just pointing to, can we please do a three generation family history? Um, I, I do genetic testing a lot, um, but not for that suicide risk. So that was more genetics because we're not looking at it. I mean, I can you know, someone who's been hospitalized four times, and then I find out that, you know, that's grandparents, there were two suicides. To me, that's, you know, that high risk individual that we need to address. So that was just a comprehensive family history that we're not doing as well. Um, C-reactive protein is, you know, an inflammatory marker that we can all get, and their research on CRP and suicides and CRP and depression. You know, the cytokines, there are labs that do it, and uh, all the research is looking at variations of different inflammatory cytokines. It's just not built in as part of our kind of routine practice, so insurance probably wouldn't cover. So that was more of a plea to see if we can kind of help uh, organize this literature to a point where maybe we could see that um, uh, small money spent on a lab could help um, identify those are higher risk. Great, thank you. I, I do have an additional follow-up question. So you mentioned using the low dose of lithium carbonate as a preventative, as a proposed preventive agent. Um, so would you, are you fairly liberal about using that in patients with inflammatory risk factors or metabolic risk factors? How do you think about that? Yeah, I've been using it uh, every day in my practice for 30 years. I use dosages from two milligrams, you know, to the 150 milligrams of carbonate um, if I'm not treating bipolar illness. So it's, you know, uh, been incredibly helpful. And um, many times you can see uh, people reporting a decreased suicidal ideation. And um, yeah, we just use a lot. Rarely would you get blood levels. Rarely would you get side effects. And, um, you know, we could uh, talk about that for hours, but the, the literature is supportive in terms of the epidemiology, but there's not a lot of clinical trials. Where the clinical trials are interesting is in actually the prevention of dementia and Alzheimer's. So that is an extensive literature where our colleagues have used low dose lithium and have demonstrated uh, prevention of uh, Alzheimer's and dementia. 
Interesting. Thank you for sharing that piece. And to your knowledge, are are there any uh, uh, kidney side effects or issues with low dose lithium administration? And no, been monitoring it for for many years. Um, I actually had a kidney a person on dialysis who you know had to stop lithium carbonate. She was one of those families with six suicides and bipolar, stabilized on lithium, then developed uh, renal disease, and um, she was switched to low dose orotate with no change in kidney function over many years. Dr. Greenblatt, this is uh, Dr. Hensley. Thank you for a wonderful talk, really enjoyed it. Um, I have recently returned back to clinical medicine at UNM after some time on the insurance side. So I thought it was interesting some of the things you said about uh, insurance and, um, you know, one thing is that, you know, any of our patients who are on antipsychotics or our children or adolescents, there's the HEDIS measures, which stands for like health care effectiveness data information set. And so most insurance companies are being tasked, like our Medicaid here in New Mexico, with improving those numbers that, you know, that we're checking those things. And so it's probably a bundled rate, you know, on the inpatient side. And I understand the, um, you know, the problems with that. But there, there is, you know, some push from insurance companies to get that data because they have to report it to um, NCQA. And so I thought that was, that was interesting. And I uh, totally agree with your use of um, lithium. And I remember my mentor, uh, Paula Clayton, who died a couple of years ago, telling us in, in the clinic that she had, you know, bipolar patients who she essentially wouldn't agree to treat unless they were on lithium because she so believed in that medication. And then later in life, she became interested in the whole, um, you know, prevention of suicide. And back then, I think we were using 300 milligrams, but um, I think it's great to hear that possibly a lower dose uh, would be effective for preventing um, suicide. And I wish they would put it in the water more. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? I covered a lot. I don't see, um, I see a question here on the chat. Um, thank you for the great lecture. What would you, uh, let me see. What you, would you particularly do for a patient with suicidality and increased inflammation markers? And this from Dr. Yaya. Okay, great question. So the, the child, uh, let's just take the adolescent who's, I mean, the ER is challenging, maybe on the inpatient unit, um, depressed, had a suicide attempt, and we come back and, and they have a elevated ferritin, another inflammatory marker, and an elevated CRP. I mean, the first thing would be why? You know, do they have underlying Lyme infection? Is it long COVID? You know, we'd look at a vitamin D. I mean, was there trauma, you know, as a child? I mean, so... The first concept is, you know, we're still mental health professionals. We would look at the psychological and the biological why. Sometimes we can understand it, uh, usually, or obesity, and, and sometimes we can't. But finding the why just personalizes the treatment. Then we can focus the treatment. But even without the why, I wouldn't want to send that boy home with those increased inflammatory markers um, yes. depression. So I would make sure that those come down. And sometimes omega-3s is a uh, curcumin, magnesium, um, or anti-inflammatory. So if I, if I see those risk factors, the cholesterol of 100, these inflammatory markers, the vitamin D of 10, our job, I would hope, is to treat these biomarkers to get them, one, they respond to medicines better, and they're going to participate in psychotherapy better. Thank you. 
Joe, we are at the top of the hour. Um, thank you so much again, Dr. Greenblatt. And uh, I will be sending uh, an, an email because he has a longer course for suicide and he agreed just to give it to the UNM uh, faculty and the residents, uh, you know, for free just to join and, and listen to the course. And I will be sending that to everyone. Thank you again, Dr. Greenblatt. And uh, multiple thank yous on the uh, chat. Thanks again. And hopefully we can see you at a different uh, Grand Rounds. Thank you all. Have a great day. Take care. Thanks.